first of all, Jim, I just want to ask you more generally about what you see as the biggest systemic risks and the top priorities for systems change. In terms of systemic risks, I would say that, of course, climate change is a huge one, but I think that equally biodiversity loss. The challenge we face is that we are in a world in which many issues are, to borrow a phrase from climate change, global concerns of humankind that require global s solutions. But we do not have the global governance in place to resolve those issues and find those solutions. So if I pull that out, we're failing to think about the interdependency both of the issues and the interdependency of nations or regions in terms of the way in which we approach it. How good a framework do you think the WTO in its current format offers for the implementation of environmental and climate policies that impact on trade and trade flows? The economy is contained within the environment and therefore whatever happens in the environment is going to affect the economy. It's this principal premise that I think needs to be better understood by international decision makers of all kinds and in all international institutions, including the WTO. The WTO, for the most part, has been uh, perfectly compatible with advancing on sustainable development on, on many fronts. Uh, the problem is not that uh, WTO rules have stood in the way of sustainable development for the most part. The problem largely is that uh, we have not seized the opportunity yet to use WTO rules in the way we promised uh, we would do in the first paragraph on the first page of the WTO treaty back in 1995. Countries like the US and China have repeatedly sued each other through the WTO for allegedly subsidizing their respective domestic renewable energy industries. And they've both been right. <laughs> so I want to know whether the WTO is actually a, a vehicle or an obstacle for achieving those Paris targets. I mean, it touches on the climate waiver and so on you talked about. Can you just talk a little bit more well, detail uh, about this? This is countries? a subsidies issue. And where Renewable energy subsidies have been found to be inconsistent with WTO rules. It's not been because there were subsidies of renewable energy. It largely been because there were domestic content provisions within these measures. There's empirical evidence that it's also deleterious to the effort to address climate change because, in fact, what you're doing is that you're imposing higher prices on those people domestically who want to uh, pursue renewable energy and you're denying them broader choices in terms of the sources of products uh, from which they might choose in shifting to renewable energy. So uh, domestic content provisions are a bad deal both economically and environmentally. Now my own view is what we need is carbon pricing. I voted for a carbon tax in, when I was in the Congress in 1993. We should be engaging in carbon pricing, but the president knows he doesn't have the votes in the Congress. And no one likes something called tax. No one wants to go home and defend it in a re-election year. So there's no carbon pricing here. It's all subsidies. With some of these subsidies, they have discriminated among foreign providers and they've discriminated in favor of domestic providers. And I don't think that's going to stand legally in the WTO. An example is the tax credits for electrical vehicles. Mm. They give favorable treatment to Canada, for example, but they don't give favorable treatment to the European Union. This is a violation of the basic rule of most favored nation yeah. treatment under the WTO treaty. Can you give some examples of what needs to change or where you see traction is building up for change? We need a WTO climate waiver. We need to identify categories of trade-related climate measures, climate laws and regulations and practices that affect trade that would generally be inconsistent with WTO rules, but are necessary to address the urgency of climate change. Ordinarily, if such 
measures had mixed motivations, both environmental and economic, they would not be eligible for the environmental defense that has existed in the World Trade Rules since the very beginning in 1947. Mm. And that's why I think we need to enact this waiver. There is very understandably often, when we look into governmental organizations or treaty negotiations and so on, a cynicism or a difficult legacy about the imbalance of the end result because of a, a difference in negotiating strength or dominant power. So how do you think that wariness about disguised protectionism can be really looked at? Developing countries especially are very fearful of the kinds of measures that the European Union is contemplating and that the United States, Japan, and Canada, and others have thought of imposing as well. Because as noble as our motivations may be in the developed world in terms of moving ahead quickly with climate action and encouraging other countries to do the same, the fact is that the commercial and economic and trade burden of these measures would fall most heavily on developing countries. They need to be accompanied by financial assistance, technical assistance, infrastructure, and other kinds of assistance that would enable these developing countries to comply with these new obligations that we would be imposing on them. As you rightly pointed out, there is the fear in a lot of developing countries that this will be just a green form of protectionism. And if we allow measures to survive WTO scrutiny, if they do have economic as well as environmental motives, well, we have to define them carefully. And we need to make certain that they are genuine climate measures, whatever their economic motivations. And we need to make certain that the developing countries have the wherewithal to comply with them. And so I'm wondering whether those criticisms of the WTO as being too Western-centric are also something where you feel there's a greater readiness to start to think afresh. I'd like to know a bit more about whether there are particular regions, particular countries that you see as taking a lead in that way, and how that momentum for change, the momentum for treating the environment as bigger than and fundamental to the economy can be accelerated. Interestingly, I, I think it is developing countries from all parts of the world who are helping leading this charge in the WTO. Countries you might not expect. Ecuador, for example, is in the forefront. Indonesia is as well. Certainly the small island states mm -hmm. Back 40 or 50 years ago, for the first time, developing countries became a majority of the membership in the WTO. They are now a significant majority. They have a real say in this institution as opposed to some of the others. That's not really a problem in the WTO. Uh, the problem, of course, is that even in the developing world, uh, there is a vast panoply on issues. There's anything but unity. Different countries are different and they have different national concerns. But I think that there is real potential for developing countries as a whole to take the lead in uh, the WTO on this issue of trying to make trade much more of an affirmative agent for sustainable development. You touched before on CBAM or Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanisms, which is an area where CISL has been doing work at the, the pan-European level. How effective do you think that CBAM type measures could be in controlling global emissions? And how can they be designed and implemented in a way that is fair to avoid the disadvantaging of the lowest income countries or green pro disguised protectionism? It's important to understand that the EU has put in place a three-year transitional period. And my impression is that this lengthy transition period is motivated by the fact that what the Europeans would really prefer 
is that the threat, if you will, of the CBAM would serve as an incentive that would encourage other countries to get together in the WTO to try to define what kinds of trade-related climate measures are permissible under the WTO mm -hmm. treaty and what kinds are not. And I hope that's what happens. But it's really interesting the way that you talked about that three-year transition period as having a dual function, potentially to put more pressure on the body of nations from the WTO perspective. I perceive that as being the noble intent of the European Union, and I think it is noble. Every member of the WTO has benefited from being a member of the system economically. Uh, the Bertelsmann Foundation uh, has uh, a recent study on that and found every single member has profited from being a member of the system. But <coughs> these are only the gains from trade overall in a country. The question is, how are these gains shared distributed. and distributed? And I don't think it's for the WTO to set the levels of taxation no. for domestic countries. These are domestic issues. And, and there's been a failure in many countries, especially my own, the United States, to make certain that the considerable gains from trade over the past uh, 25 and 30 years have been shared widely by the population. Mm -hmm. And much of the opposition to trade in the United States and elsewhere uh, has come because of that fact. Little has been done to make certain that these trade gains end up in higher incomes for a lot of middle mm -hmm. class and working people. Little has been done to make certain there can be a just transition because of more open economies. Mm -hmm. But the answer is not to close the economies. The answer is not to deny ourselves those economic gains. The answer is to do much more to make certain that those gains are shared much more widely. Mm -hmm. If we take the circular economy seriously, and, and pick any product you wish, what kinds of changes could we make so that that type of global virtuous cycle might be more rather than less likely? Jim. Let me take the issue of plastics. We have all the plastic the world needs. We don't need to make any more plastic. So why not condition trade on making certain that the production processes that are part of making that traded product include recycling. In, in general, I think we need to be accelerating the environmental pillar of sustainable development in trade, not just climate change, but issues relating to the production of forest products, the production of all agricultural products. How does the WTO fit in the COP system? Is it sitting as an observing organization? That's an extraordinarily important question. I think a lot of it has to do domestically with the fact that the COP is generally serviced by the environmental ministries of countries and the WTO is serviced by the trade ministries. Climate negotiators were often told not to touch trade in their negotiations. Yeah. In my view, this notion I have of defining certain trade-related climate measures should be a joint task for the COP and the WTO. Why should the trade people alone write these rules? Isn't this also a climate issue? All the members of the WTO are also members of the COP. They're the same countries. They just have different ministries back home that oftentimes refuse to work together. Part of climate finance is trade finance, but the WTO has not even been asked to be a part of the upcoming COP to, t to discuss trade finance. And that's a huge problem for developing countries, especially right now. There's a real discordance here that I think needs to be changed. The 
the Singapore Stock Exchange now requires every board director to be trained in sustainable development and so on. So we're starting to see really interesting ways in which, for want of a better word, the levers of change or the bedrocks of the establishment can themselves at national or broader levels start to think about the additional and complementary ways for putting sustainability at the very heart of the way that they operate. For businesses, climate change is not something that can be denied for political reasons. Climate change is a cost factor and it's a risk factor in doing business. So whether they're required by their governments to take it into account or not, they have to do so if they're going to survive and if they're going to continue to be profitable. For us at CISL, that nexus between sustainable finance, sustainable business and the work of policy and government is really critical. It's the activation and the alignment of these different levers to really accelerate systemic change. It's very important. We're very interested in thinking how you get that urgent change to happen faster. The international trade regime is as technical and alien and abstract as one might imagine compared with the citizen or the consumer or the influencer in the street. But I would just be very interested to think if there's also a way in which the enlightened consumer or sort of more mass demand to see change in the trade regimes might ever develop. That cumulative participation can ultimately lead to the cumulative political pressure to act in a different way. So the more that consumers, the more that citizens can be engaged in working for these causes, the greater response there will be.